so you are very much uh, on time. At uh, 2 o'clock, you have started the session. I hope that everyone has actually come back. I see that uh, directly here, we have 100 over people uh, on screen. So uh, welcome back. And this is going to be a very interesting session because we are now into digital era. And in the digital era, we do have this very distinguished uh, panelist with us uh, today. So we're going to extract the most out of them uh, since we are given only one hour. Um, now, each of those uh, panelists, from uh, Mr. Go Ping Ui to Dr. Liu Ekam to Dr. Henry Go to Mr. Cornish Kochai, they all have very long CV and profile. And I would like to urge you to go through the participants' uh, information pack to read through those uh, profiles so that we could actually save a bit of time. As you know that uh, their profile would usually take about two pages. All right. Uh, so we are very fortunate and we're going to kick start soon. And the format is this. I would like to invite each of the panelists to use about eight minutes to share with us their thoughts about the digital transformation in ASEAN, especially towards digital ASEAN. And thereafter, I think that will take about half an hour and we will have the rest of the time to explore some of the uh, very critical questions uh, for each and every uh, panelist to comment and then also to open the session to the floor for any question that you may have. All right. Uh, so with that, the first speaker that I'd like to invite uh, to give us that his uh, wisdom and insights will be Mr. Go Peng Ui, the founder and chairman of a civil league group uh, that has been operating in more than 100 countries, serving more than 380 banks. And in fact, without, I dare to say, without Silver Lake Group, there wouldn't be a digital ASEAN. So, Mr. Gore, please take the floor. Hi, right, good afternoon. Uh, before I share some charts, well, we are now talking about uh, digital ASEAN, ASEAN and uh, the scaling up to that environment. And I'm I'm going to share some charts. What are the environment like? And what kind of responses that we need uh, to survive or scale up in that environment? Uh, let me start the sharing. Can you see the uh, sharing? Yes. OK, let me yeah. make it full screen. Yes. Uh, the first phenomenon is that uh, the risk opportunity symmetry is actually widening up. Now that, that uh, uh, you can ignore the word symmetry if you uh, find that it's too technical, but uh, there is a phenomenon in uh, banking, which is the word called interest rate. Now why interest rate survive for thousands of years must be because of some natural phenomenon and that natural phenomenon is actually symmetry. But uh, interest rate is actually against risk opportunity and that is widening up. So uh, it's going to lead to changes in economic theories, monetary theories, uh, country priorities, and the phenomenon of the uh, globalization. And uh, if even trigger the shadow of a dot-com crash again. Now money as defined, for the last few thousand years, as a number with narrow interest rate is no more true. And so you see a lot of interesting phenomena of uh, burning money and uh, uh, throwing three billions and tens of billions in things that you thought why and, and thought make no sense, but sometimes it makes sense. And why is that making sense is actually because of risk opportunity equation. Now, as long as you throw uh, money into the right opportunity and there's a return, whatever, whatever things that look funny is actually not funny. Now, the, this environment leads to something called new capitalization, uh, capitalism and new socialism. Now, these are uh, words uh, being used by uh, Prime Minister Kishida 
of the new Prime Minister of Kishida of Japan, new capitalism. Wow, what China is actually doing is a new socialism. Now, that is in response of changing the uh, uh, role of numbers instead of focusing on economic numbers like GDP and is moving into simple games like looking at uh, uh, better infrastructure, better healthcare, self-sufficiency, uh, security, and uh, better education, better environment. So if you see from that point of view, then the cutting down of coal uh, uh, usage in China, causing some uh, disruption in electric city supply is actually not a surprise. And cutting down steel production, therefore causing, causing inflation is actually also not a surprise. Now, so obviously that leads to the globalization and that can be uh, a very big uh, impact to uh, the uh, equation of competitive advantage. And ideas, the so-called ideas are now more and more a commodity. And uh, obviously we are observing that the rising threat of invisible hand and uh, leading like COVID-19 and uh, maybe next is climate change with, which will lead to many other problems and diseases that we most likely are going to face soon. Now, so if you look at ASEAN, let's look at ASEAN. Now, when you look at ASEAN, it's always about uh, sharing uh, 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 the so-called uh, profile versus the, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, this, the, the profile is basically the sharing a portion and the individual portion. Now, when you look at it, uh, the part that is shared by every country is technology, banking and finance. Now, of course, uh, there are certain behaviors like taxis and, uh, and of course, uh, shared partnerships, uh, shared purposes and so on and so forth. Now, there is a horizontal parameter that cut across the region. In fact, cut across the whole Asia Pacific and of course, cut across the world. And from there, you can see the important role of digital digitization and digitalization or technologies. Now, we, if we move and to see the responses, well, there are various areas of response. And uh, what we see, people burning, burning money like uh, uh, Uber and, uh, and uh, shopping, and the Alibaba now all started by burning billions of US dollar. And the game is actually relatively simple, focusing on behavior and uh, using money to enhance capabilities and therefore leads to near monopoly. Now that would be the traditional, that would be the current, maybe the last 20 years of, uh, of investments from uh, investment communities. The biggest opportunity that uh, have not been tapped is actually the horizontal portion where involving those areas of invisible hands like COVID responses definitely cues and at the same time uh, actually promoted many companies to the top of the world. And uh, trust as a business, regulation, rules and regulations, purposes, shared values and coverage. Now, of course, those can be broken into many details of responses, but uh, as a whole, these are groups of opportunities that, uh, that, uh, that we can address. And that is exactly what we have been playing in ASEAN. Uh, if you look at the uh, civil group, uh, most people are confused. What actually is a civil group, group because it doesn't look like there is a specific business that we are in, except people heard of it, heard of us, uh, starting from banking and finance. But if you look at that, that is very much a shared value, uh, a block of businesses, and uh, and uh, since since the the inception, we actually 
at a certain point grew to 130 companies. And, uh, and finally, we, the fact that it is a shared value system that we narrow it down back to three, com three groups of company, which is the supply side and the demand side and the fund side of the companies. So now this is how we respond in ASEAN, in Asia Pacific, and uh, widening it to Western Europe and Africa. Now this, these are areas that we, we actually work on. But if you ask why, this chart actually explain why, where the opportunity that we were looking at. Now, so therefore we differ from everyone else like uh, Uber or, 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 or Alibaba and very much uh, an ecosystem provider or e ecosystem play. And, uh, and when you look at all the combinations of things, these are all the possibly possible work, possible ways of attacking the opportunities in ASEAN, Asia Pacific, or across the world. Now you can see 6A is, is raise money, is one way of uh, playing games. And, I, I, and many young people are actually doing, doing that, but the most important thing is go back to the reason why. Why, where are the opportunities? What are the, uh, uh, the factors that, uh, that, that can make those opportunities turn real? Now, uh, on the economic side, well, there are many things that is no more the same. So the same is no more the same. So, so words like capitalism, socialism is not the same anymore. And uh, best in the class is no more good enough. And therefore, supply side alone may not be good enough. And uh, well, the last is not to repeat history, but pause and think. Because repeating history could be just careless and a pause and think and look before you leave is most likely the way that we can respond to this UV, UCBA world. Now, a uh, quick look at Civil League. And if you look at it, there are different colors in how we respond to this environment. And basically that is supply side, demand side, fund side and compliance and regulations. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Goh. You have been, you know, leaving a lot of puzzles in people's mind, requiring everyone to solve their own puzzle. Basically, yes, thank you for, thank you for throwing out this whole picture of the risk opportunity symmetry, the new capitalism and the new socialism, the globalization and the strategy towards uh, the disruptive future and uh, look, but uh, can't see before you leave. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I've been in this um, ICT or digital uh, uh, industry for the last 30 years. I think certainly we continue to draw a lot of wisdom and inspiration from Mr. Gore. Thank you. Uh, now, moving next, I would like to invite another very illustrious uh, personality, uh, though it's actually lesser uh, spoke about uh, in this uh, in, in some of those uh, forums, uh, it's none other than Dr. Lee Oikam. Lee, Dr. Lee actually came from a very illustrious family business. I'm not going to touch on a family bis business. And today she's uh, speaking to us as her capacity um, as this chairman of Cash Tech uh, Holding. And I think suffice to just say that she graduated as a medical doctor and expanded her interest and involvement and investment into technology, into ICT, and has gone very far with that. And also she has been very much involved in social enterprise and philanthropy. And today we're gonna to hear your wisdom, uh, Dr. Lee, in this uh, ASEAN, uh, especially SME uh, funding situation. Dr. Lee, please. Thank you, Dr. Wei. Good afternoon. Tan Sri Michael Yeo, Chairperson KSI, Your Excellencies, Distinguished Guests and Participants. So this morning, I have heard and learned from the various panels from government, public and private sectors 
on leader, ASEAN leadership and, and partnerships. I am optimistic that with all the brains sharing a focused viewpoint to reset, explore and implement strategies for ASEAN landscape post pandemic COVID towards an economic recovery. There is a silver lining. As changing geopolitical and ESG demands, it's appropriate we have an increased risk appetite in the business community because we have to make decisions faster for both macro and micro issues facing business owners. And this is because the changing landscape is changing all the time. It doesn't take five years. It's like every quarter you're seeing something new on the horizon. So today I would like to share my thoughts on how SME, if given help in overcoming their challenges, can be a driving force for their own economic recovery and thus contributing to the country and the region. So I have availed myself in the past 15 years in digitalization wave by being an investor and working as partners serving the SMEs in uh, eight or nine countries. And they are SMEs become one of our target market segment. So where do we come from? Asian, ASEAN can play a key regional hub. How? It can support SME on integrating them into most important, the global value chain. How can they maintain free and open trade digital economy, cutting across all business sectors and business size, and then moving towards establishing better policies, standards, design that are predictable and interoperable? You see, what happened is that when they are guidelines can get better as we learn from mistakes, like when they are fraud, cybersecurity improve. Now, this is the job and the main role that governments and big enterprise can play in the infrastructure. And this will allow by setting predictable rules, then allow digital solution companies to provide better trusted user experience. You know, so that is this ecosystem between governments and digital providers of infrastructure or solutions. So at this point, I will leave it to the 5Gs, Hawaii is here, and data clouds, the cloud uh, management, then you have um, cyber security, and you have transaction rules, trade rules and guidelines. And this is under the purview of the government or the big enterprise. Now, what happened to the SMEs? Just think about it. The SMEs as a small enterprise, this whole digital landscape is difficult to maneuver alone. And the call to invest a budget into the digital landscape is very far from the mind, there's this fear or this hesitancy of the hidden cost. What are unknown costs if I invest in certain digital solutions? And worst of all, will they improve my revenue? So, so these are all the concerns of the SMEs towards digitalization. But what are their challenges? It remains the same. Cash flow. How do I access supply chain? How do I access competitive markets, right? And if you look at it, this is exactly what I think ministries like MITI or Infacom or PICOM can all play or even trade associations or what we call uh, business NGOs can play a big part. How can we play this big part? You see, I'm talking about an ecosystem whereby it's easy for the micro or bigger medium enterprise can participate without these challenges of getting on board. 
So I want to speak very specifically on marketplaces. You know, I don't see why uh, trade association are not looking at marketplace for their members. What is a marketplace? A marketplace is where there is a sponsor or manager, right? It's like managing a condo with many residents. And they put together digital solutions so everyone can just jump on board and use. And number one, in today's marketplace uh, comp competition, uh, you can join free with maybe an annual membership later on. Or the, the, the investment to join any marketplace is minimal. So one option is for uh, government support grants for SME to go through trade associations to do one or two things. Look at and certify marketplaces and recommend to their members. And marketplace should be what we call horizontally transacted, you know, because in a digital economy, you can't have most associations are what we call vertically priced, the auto industry, the manufacturers, but we are looking at what we call the general trade associations. They already have a community. It's just like at government level, we are talking about trade blocks. What about connected communities? And for connected communities, these are the benefits. Um, most connected communities have improve service staff who are experienced to manage the marketplace, understand the technology they put on board for their members, and can provide education and continual service to use their marketplace as their revenue point. And usually for an SME, the investment is pretty small, maybe a setup fee of $1,000, $500, you know, and some are even free, right? And uh, so the less risk of investment going in, the, 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 the move for, commun for SME community to, to be a strong block is what each country can look towards. And it doesn't matter to have one monopoly. How about multiple communities? Previously, we talked about six degrees of separation before you get to a customer. Now we're talking about one degree. All marketplaces have strong search engine on their own directories. Look for marketplace has very good KYCs, not because we are talking about B2B marketplace in terms of supply chain or competitive market, right? So digital solutions for KYCs, how, how can they improve? Because building trust is very important. Who do I know? After that, I can call them. But before I can do business, uh, I need somebody to evaluate that 100,000 communities in different marketplaces. How do I do that? You know, The second one, when we talk about marketplace, what do they look for? What we look for, number one, is um, what sort of specialized service do they provide? And there will be, for example, a logistic community. You know, all the carriers come in, but on one main carrier or logistic from them, CNA comes in and provide a very transparent, smooth moving of products that include documentation. And this refer again to my earlier comment, you know, trade rules must be transparent to digital solution provider. If not, how can they put in the algorithms to understand what will be accepted as governance in the trade environment? Then we talk about, besides KYCs, SMEs are now provided with this whole concept. Another one is besides digital acceleration, ESG acceleration of demands. Suddenly they are stopped because I'm supply chain to a bigger conglomerate and they are forcing ESG demands on me. How are they going to do that? Because then they have to work into a marketplace where ESG is a very strong component, right? 
Then the third one is their marketplace to provide very strong what we call settlement processes. Now, a lot of settlements, if they are not paid or delay payment, this is a big impact on your cash flow. How about marketplaces because of digitalization, tokenization, as a transaction is being carried on, immediately payment is received. How do marketplace deal with that? Is it factoring or is it tokenizing trade credits? There are actually another form of payment that can be used within the same community. So, so I have always said that, and, and this is my field of uh, interest, I felt that really being in the marketplace, understanding marketplace, and for governments to expand more grants to trade association to increase the executive team, right? Because you need focused research, focused uh, understanding in digital professionals on pulling out what is real and what's not real from the digital world. So if we were to look at the whole ecosystem, uh, then I'm going to comment on investors. Investors must be less, take more risks, invest in startups. If that, they, might, they might be the plan of the future. You, you, you invest for, okay, impact investing for philanthropy. How about just helping a potential startup that can fit into marketplace? Because when that happens, it helps a lot of SMEs. That is the driver of the economy. Um, thank you for listening to some of my thoughts regarding focus on marketplace to help SMEs. Well, thank you, Lee, uh, Dr. Lee. You actually have uh, envisioned something that could actually be very powerful in ASEAN, the digital ASEAN. Uh, and by actually, first of all, calling on the government to have transparency in the trade rules so that everyone know how to play. Then secondly, you also call for associations, uh, maybe facilitating, calling upon their members to actually come together, getting the grant from government if possible, and then join force, be a, a part of marketplace. And because marketplace, as you envision, is the one that prepare the digital platform that everyone could actually, with the minimal investment and subscription, get on board the marketplace and therefore solve multiple issues. The first issue to solve would be the market access, then followed by the cash flow and so forth. All right. Okay. So certainly uh, that will be a very powerful recommendation that we have captured and we'd like to uh, now uh, move on to the third uh, speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lee. And the third speaker is uh, uh, Dato Henry Go, who is a uh, co-founder as well as a COO of Macro Kiosk that, uh, that has been a, a, a company of my admiration uh, as well uh, because I can see that you know, they have grown into, from uh, startups and then getting investment and now they operate in multiple countries uh, uh, around the whole region. So um, I, I think we will have to, a lot to hear from uh, Dr. Henry as well. Uh, Dr. Henry graduated from the uh, MBA uh, from the University of Boston and so forth. And he has been very active as a mentor, uh, as a, uh, yeah, especially mentor in this Founder Institute and Magic and so forth. Yes, I'm going to uh, pass the floor to Dr. Henry Go. Yes, a very good afternoon, uh, Dr. Wei. Um, thanks for the introduction. And of course, uh, thanks to KSI and uh, Tan Sri Michael for the invitation. Uh, and of course, nice to be back uh, sharing in this panel with uh, my fellow panelists, uh, some with which we might uh, share on a couple of panels before. Uh, I think, yeah, whatever they have shared does make sense in terms of how uh, ASEAN is uh, trying to drive themselves towards digitalization. Um, coming back to the, to the title of our chat today, I would say, really, to the point of uh, digital transformation in ASEAN. I think in terms of digital scalability, uh, you know, we have been, ASEAN uh, have been a bit slow, I would say, pre-COVID. 
but all of a sudden we get a major boost uh, from the pandemic um, for the past two years now almost uh, in the sense that uh, the digitalization uh, requirement uh, the, or digitalization demands uh, have you know, outgrown uh, in terms of what we expect it to be you know, in terms of there are so many people uh, getting access to the internet now um, and the multiple activities uh, have been you know, uh, running around in the internet sphere, such as, of course, shopping uh, and, and things like that. Um, and even like there are reports coming up now from companies like uh, Google and Tamasic and itself uh, in the sense that uh, the digital economy uh, would be something like close to about 10% of the whole ASEAN GDP. Uh, by the year 2025. I think that's just a report now, which I think could be even achieving that numbers in a, in a much earlier time timeline itself. So if you ask me in terms of scalability or the, how to scale up, I believe uh, the scale is already there. Uh, if you can see, there are already uh, seven to eight uh, ASEAN citizens or members of ASEAN already uh, have access to the internet. Uh, have access to some form of digital device uh, and that itself is a major, major big market. However, of course, the key then is not just about getting the citizen digitalized, but then how about uh, government being digitalized or even uh, companies are being digitalized. I think that's, that's the part that is still uh, very much uh, lacking, I would say, in that sense. Um, however, you know, uh, because the markets, because there's a big citizen, I mean, there's a big population of people you having access to the internet and having access to digitalized equipment, uh, there are now a lot of companies, of course, as you can see, startups or even now mega startups or what they call unicorns are already in the market uh, trying to access to this, to this uh, uh, population or this uh, internet economy itself. However, that of course creates a very big uh, disparity in that sense Then there are a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say cannibalization, but rather that again, then a lot of uh, older companies or even SMEs, for example, uh, is then in the losing round because uh, of these big companies like Alibaba, or Lazada, or all these companies coming in, which then creates a very big challenge to how commerce uh, have been done in most of these countries in ASEAN. So I think the, the key challenge now is then how can we uh, you know, not losing out the, the digital market uh, to just a few players, but then to give uh, equal access or equal opportunity to all the SMEs and even companies uh, from the older industries to come on board and to then be part of this uh, digital uh, ecosystem. Uh, this is the really the big challenge. I mean, for the past two years, uh, there are a lot of people trying to digitalize their business and come to, trying to sell their business or sell their products on the internet. But that is just the, 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 just the tip of the iceberg of what's true uh, digitalization is, for example. So I really think is that um, like what uh, Dr. Lee talked about, I think really that there must be an equal uh, rule. So ASEAN itself or government by itself should be very transparent in terms of uh, the rules and regulation uh, so that it can create a very equal playing ground for everyone uh, in terms of how we get access to markets. Uh, like for example, logistics companies, uh, whether they are logistic companies, uh, uh, international logistic companies or even local logistic companies, they should be treated uh, equally uh, and given the same opportunity. And I think this is some area of policies that needs to be clear. Um, and also, of course, uh, how can then uh, government facilitate an environment uh, where uh, not just on hard infrastructure, because uh, ASEAN in itself, uh, we have been growing uh, simply through hard labor and also hard infrastructure, uh, such as, for example, maybe probably through properties and through having bigger factories or having better infrastructure in terms of roads. But I think the lacking part of infrastructure going forward is then the human infrastructure, 
Uh, so the disparity now we have come, we have countries in ASEAN that is uh, really good in human capital, uh, but we also have country, uh, countries in ASEAN that's very poor in human capital. And I think the, the key part is then how can we build up human capital between ASEAN or even between individual countries in ASEAN uh, to make sure that we are ready uh, for the uh, digital environment, especially post-COVID uh, 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 growth, for example. Because in in that in that sense, uh, uh, because of the disparity in human capital investments or human capital growth in different countries, uh, richer countries in itself are getting richer, and the poorer countries are getting poorer because the poorer company, countries have to then uh, acquire technology or even uh, import know how from uh, richer countries. And I think this is something that needs to look at. I think there's a there needs to be a shift in the thoughts of the government. So how to then emphasize uh, development of the economy through uh, human capital rather than through building uh, bigger factories or bigger roads or taller buildings, for example. I think this is an area uh, of mismatch in how we can grow the company, uh, grow, grow the country uh, to make sure that we can fully embrace digitalization and bring not just uh, the, the population being digitalized, but then the whole economy itself is uh, benefiting from uh, a digitalized um, environment. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we should go more towards the Q&A as we talk about, but I think uh, I would say that, uh, just to summarize a little bit, in the sense that uh, the population in ASEAN is already digitalized. I think that's really good, especially due to the cost by the current pandemic. I think what's lacking behind is then for the economy uh, in terms of the companies. So I think this is an area where uh, government can play a little bit better role in terms of having a clearer guidelines uh, and having clearer initiatives to drive companies towards digitalization. And for the longer term, it would really be then uh, how to maximize the digital economy and the benefit of digitalization is then investment towards human capital. Uh, and I think this is an area uh, where, where a lot of ASEAN countries are lacking and this is an area that we should prove to further capitalize on uh, digitalization. So yeah, that's what really I want to talk about today. So uh, maybe there's any Q&A along the way here. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Wing. Back to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Henry Go. So uh, while you talk about, you know, this uh, digitalization in ASEAN has been accelerated because of the pandemic. So we are likely to have a higher GDP uh, contribution of digital economy in ASEAN. Uh, comes to uh, 2025 to more than 10 percent and i think you have raised uh, the red flag the red flag on multiple front first of all it is the the challenges coming from some of the other giants such as uh, alibaba lazada and so on so where would be the the kind of room for the local uh, commerce uh, players uh, secondly uh, the rules and regulations are sometimes not so transparent uh, like you got the example of logistic industry, can we can we treat uh, other you know the foreign entities better than local? So that's also another so called uh, red flag that you you were raising, and uh, the third part that you highlighted that it is important to develop the human capital in this uh, towards the digitalization rather than building more factories and using more land. So while these are multiple points, uh, thank you. We are going to uh, take. Um, Pause here and, uh, and move on to the fourth uh, speaker. That is uh, Mr. Konesh Kochai, who is the Director of Industry Eco Engagement of Huawei. Uh, well, very, very long uh, list of, uh, you know, the background and credential uh, of uh, Mr. Uh, Konesh Kochai. Uh, he has been 21 years, uh, very active in ICT field. Uh, of course, within that 16 years uh, in the telco experience as well. Uh, with the ecosystem, various technology, thought leadership, rules, regulation, I think this has been a forte of Mr. Konesh Kochai, and we're going to hear from you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Bang. I hope you guys can hear me clearly. Uh, thank you again to Tansi Michael, Dr. Bang, Mr. Go Peng, Dr. Lee, Dr. Dr. Henry. Some wonderful insights where uh, Mr. Gopeng highlighted that there are more questions than answers today when one talks about uh, digital contributions to 
economy in the future and what infrastructure role has to play and how widening disparity is a cause of concern in this digital journey that we have all collectively taken and why we need to rise above the business or industry based approach to a more holistic ecosystem based approach further dr lee suggested uh, and rightly so that why we need to focus uh, on smes right how they can uh, jump on to this digital bandwagon with least impact in terms of cost where they can have this digital journey on boarding as a service right and how government can help build transparency uh, and right policies built around it dr so henry further suggested the most important one having to address the need of rightful digital talent availability uh, in the geographies that we operate uh, because th that is one of the most critical resource that will kind of make all this infrastructure and economic output more effective without the, uh, the digital skill set that is all uh, useless right so today's discussion on digital transformation is very timely and apt especially in the context of asia which is one of the fastest growing inter market internet market in the world now as we all agree that it is one of the most populous and diverse regions in the world however we are confident it's on track on becoming one of the top 5 digital economies by 2025 now all my fellow panelists have uh, uh, a kind of highlighted the uh, the challenge of growing population what growing population does is that everybody needs a better job they need uh, better safety measures better healthcare system better education system that that pushes a large amount of population to settle in urban areas right where they try to access these services which government enterprises industries all of us as an ecosystem tend to extend these services to them right and this becomes a scalable challenge in an urban area now people who are extending or staying outside the urban areas typically in rural areas or industrial sectors just outside the big cities they also need better connectivity better transportation better health services as highlighted earlier. now we all have this challenge for last few decades and digital came in as a solution which could address all these needs in a very uniform Uh, the quickest manner and in a sustainable manner, right? Now, to coming back to the topic of digital transformation, digital transformation increasingly is now being used as a singular word. However, I would like to spend a, a minute or so in trying to say, given the population and industrialization need that I just highlighted, the need for us is to come together and transform, because without the way. without the change in the way we are interacting with each other conducting our business getting other people on board this all needs to change and what i am saying is it cannot be addressed through an evolution it has to really transform right so transformation need is the primary need that has to bring us all together now using digital as a medium gives us a tool in the shape of digital transformation that we are all trying to address trying to answer the questions that are uh, around that are present today in terms of digital transformation here now industry wise every industry realizes the potential of uh, digital uh, transformation and the digital it can bring i mean it's clearly highlighted that digital economy in asean alone has a potential of 1 trillion dollars in next 10 years of gdp contribution so if a uh, we at huawei try to map in terms of various industries where do they stand today in terms of digital maturity and not a surprise uh, industries like uh, financing industry uh, entertainment industry media industry uh, some part of education industry and communications they lie right on the uh, top of the curve which is in the shape of an s with a very very long tail right with industrial sectors like agricultural constructions they're just at the uh, fag end of the tail just in starting their uh, digital journey now uh, the question is, is is it worth it to bring everybody uh, to democratize digital as dato henry said that everybody needs to bring digital skill set and therefore systems around it of course the answer is yes because who would not like to uh, exploit the trillion dollar opportunity in asean alone right but is this trillion dollar opportunity 
pure academic one. Now, we are present in 170 plus countries giving ICT products, solutions, and services, uh, trying to get to as many people, enterprise, and government as possible. Uh, we have good enough data to suggest that if you put a dollar in ICT area versus a non-ICT area, the dollar in ICT area will grow, will give you an ROI of 6.7 times compared to the traditional uh, non-ICT investment. And to the extent that the, the facilities that are, or the services that are coming on a digital paradigm, once they start leading to a sort of monetary output through the exchanges and interactions that people and businesses are doing, that gives rise to digital economy, which is not surprised. We are not surprised that digital economy is growing 2.5 times more than traditional economy. And therefore, to uh, Mr. Goping's point that uh, now, all these measures, how we measure GDP, what contributes to building that GDP is changing and changing very fast, right? Therefore, we all need to come together to address all these questions, right? Now, it's, it's very timely that ASEAN Digital Master Plan is released in January uh, this year, right? Because what happened is uh, the digital journey that we were trying to advocate and uh, trying to develop in these markets uh, came to a standstill when COVID hit us, right? Millions of people, we were forced to stay indoors. We changed the way we were conducting business. We changed the way we were working. We changed the way we were educating our children. We changed the way how we were accessing these healthcare facilities. What it did, the positive side of it is that it reestablished that we need digital and intelligent connectivity as a fundamental layer to survive and sustain in the future, right? And ASEAN Digital Master Plan is very, very accurate, although it started a few years back, but the kind of master plan framework and the element it uh, presented to us. Uh, let me simplify that for you. There are eight, nine drivers that are listed there, but what it essentially says is start with, firstly, today's COVID measures, stimulus packages, these all need to be there on the field. Now, how it reaches the intended uh, population is you need to have fundamental digital infrastructure layer, which is to see your broadband networks, cloud, AI, big data, IoT, accessible equally and uniformly to people, industries, enterprises in a uniform fashion. Once you have that infrastructure, you need to build trust on using this infrastructure. Therefore, all that data privacy, cybersecurity is the next avenue you need to focus on. Now, having built these two foundation layers, you need somebody to run it. Therefore, you need to focus on talent development around it, right? Now, once all these elements are accelerated, prioritized, and adoption is done, then the transactions, the digital business, business adoption, the digital trade, uh, as uh, my fellow panelists have identified, this will all be enabled because there is trust in the system. We have people who are trying to manage these services, right? And, and leading to an economic output. And this will all make the holistic gig economy, circular economy, it will enable all those puzzle pieces to lead to a GDP output, right? Now, having said that, all this cannot be done with the policy and the regulatory synergy, right? Because what we need to do is two things. A, we all need to come together so that these transactions are between ASEAN to ASEAN SMEs, ASEAN to ASEAN business, ASEAN business to ASEAN population, right? Then only the output will remain in the region and lead to the GDP output. Second most important point is we need to change the fundamental way in which we measure the progress of digital journey. Today, various benchmarking exists in, among countries. Now, that benchmarking needs to be looked at from a different perspective. It's not comparing a nation to another nation, right? If a nation is better in managing a fintech industry, if a nation is man uh, better in managing the manufacturing digitalization, those learnings needs to be leveraged by other countries in ASEAN to bring to the same level, right? So le firstly, identifying those national strengths, prioritizing digitalization around it, then leveraging that knowledge across the region to convert it into an output. Now, how all this can be done is today, 
if we build a digital infrastructure, we measure if you have built a 4G network, how much connectivity have we reached, right? Now, this approach needs to change. Whereas measurements needs to be categorized into three buckets. If I have put an infrastructure, the infrastructure is just an input to digital growth, right? Therefore, the KPIs to ensure that the right digital infrastructure has gone in is input KPIs, right? Now, having put that infrastructure, are my SMEs digitalized? Is my, uh, let's say, a car assembly plant in a region like Kulim, is that digitalized? That's still just the output, right? So having put the right infrastructure, having digitalized a particular aspect of the ecosystem, that's an output. Now, is this digitalization leading to economic growth? That's an outcome. So equal weightage needs to be put in all these aspects of input, output, and outcome in order to bring us all together to really exploit the potential that digital has. And, and the fundamental thing remains that we need to collaborate. So on that note, very happy to answer any questions around infrastructure or any field that I, uh, I have contributed to. Thank you so much again for this opportunity. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Konish. Uh, you actually have given like a very concise picture uh, from the big picture of ASEAN, the need for transformation and digital, digital is actually a tool. And you have led on to use the ASEAN digital master plan as the core uh, point for us to ponder upon, uh, of which it has eight, nine drivers ranging from COVID-19 measures to stimulus package, how to make it accessible uniformly uh, using the digital infrastructure and platform to the, the people who need it, and then have the digital talent to manage and operate so that we get the digital economy output, output as well as outcome. And then there's also a need to have the policy and regulatory synergy in ASEAN. All right. So while those are very much packed with the solid points there, and we're going to have a very well, quick question a session. I think we have a limited time. I wish that we have two hours, but looks like I think we have to kind of quickly post a few questions here because there are at least four big uh, questions. But could I just uh, invite the speaker to use one minute to respond to this? Uh, first one is this the rise of ASEAN digital giants such as Grab, uh, because you know, Dr. Henry talked about you know Lazada and all this, but you know, Grab. Uh, has gone to list to much respect. And then Bukalapak has listed in Indonesia. And soon, go to uh, the merger of this, uh, these two companies are also going ahead with the IPO plan. What is the implication to the ASEAN businesses and also ASEAN digitalization? Is this better? Is this uh, otherwise? Mr. Gore, please. Okay. Uh... Well, uh, if you refer to my second chart, um, this responds to so-called behaviors and capabilities. And uh, well, they, they are all or, uh, horizontal behaviors, they are vertical behaviors. Now, when it is about uh, uh, things like Grabs or Gojek or, or Tokopedia, now these are all uh, behaviorals and uh, uh, capabilities and uh, usually driven by, driven by uh, huge investment of uh, uh, dollar and cents. Uh, are you, that, that should, it should be a good thing because when it comes to behaviors and capabilities, it is actually relatively easy to respond. Uh, and that you see uh, uh, Tony is coming out with uh, his uh, uh, Asia ride. And in the long run, most likely it will trigger a lot of other responses, whether big and small, so I see overall, it is actually a good phenomenon. Right, how about a quick response from Dr. Lee, please. Yeah, okay. I, I think the phenomenon of um, Grab, I would say is a case of early bird catch the worm, but the impact of uh, this type of delivery service door to door, we already see that during pandemic, it has provided a lot of uh, transient maybe livelihood to the riders, to delivery men. It has kept FMB alive from take-home deliveries. So 
rather than I would focus on the impact such um, digital uh, availability can impact this economy. All right. Uh, thank you. I, I'd like to kind of pose a second question quickly to the other two panelists. The ASEAN digital talent and the digital leadership, how to close the competency gap so that we can effectively perform the digital transformation in ASEAN? Uh, to Dr. Henry Go as well as uh, Mr. Konesh. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I think the, the key point here is that yeah, there's a big discrepancy if you talk about ASEAN as a whole. I mean, you have probably some countries are. Uh, they have invested a lot in terms of uh, digital leadership and even digital human capital, uh, whereas there are a lot of countries that are not as well. I think the, the, the key point, if we could, we could look at country by country per se, uh, the situation is, is very much different. Uh, however, I think that uh, the, the key point is that it could be as simple as even changing syllabus in schools. <laughs> I think that there's really something that uh, many countries are not doing maybe due to political reasons or, or, or what's not. Um, I think this is an area where um, yeah, governments should focus on education uh, and try to change the education that suits uh, the digital uh, world, uh, not just in, in gaining opportunity. It can be even, even as simple as probably not getting fraud on the digital world. I think these are things that, that the government needs to do. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Konesh. Uh, your response? Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, rightly so. So, uh, what I would like to add further is that uh, almost ninety percent of the enterprises that we talk to identify resonate with this talent or skill gap in in these countries, right? But but I think specifically it needs to work around uh, both the segments uh, of future workforce, which needs to start at engaging at the student level, revising the curriculum and. Uh, helping the school industry to introduce these new digital topics, which can uh, really prepare this workforce for the future. At the same time, the very short term priority is to uh, reskill or upskill the people who are currently uh, functioning in the non ICT space. Right. Therefore, we at Huawei are uh, in in uh, collaboration with government. We have programs like Seed for Future and ICT Talent Development Labs. Uh, in, in Malaysia, for example, when the lockdown happened. We could st still train uh, thousands of people when we deploy the cloud solution in uh, uh, Malaysia with TM. So, I mean, the, the opportunity is there, the potential exists in terms of even teaching these through digital solutions. And this is one priority which needs to be addressed more than infrastructure, because fundamentally we have some level of infrastructure already there, but talent is something which will take it to the next level. So, absolutely agree with that. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you. Short term and the long term solution in the human capital uh, development, uh, especially digital talent. Uh, now, I want to move on to the third question, uh, because the multiple speakers talk about this, the government policies and regulation towards a digital transformation. Um, what are those areas that government, government could do uh, I turn, uh, in terms of uh, transparency or in terms of the the deployment of agile regulation in order to enable rapid digital adoption. What can government do? Uh, I, I'd like to direct this to uh, first uh, two speakers, uh, Mr. Gore and also Dr. Lee. Well, uh, um, as I said, it's better for government not to do anything. You know, sometimes uh, it is better to leave it to science than. Uh, I believe general uh, digitization itself has its own uh, forces and sciences has its own forces. And therefore it is more important for government to encourage uh, R&D, encourage all the progress of sciences, progress of digitization and let the forces to work on its own. It's very difficult to block natural forces. So when government try to do something, you are actually fighting God. And uh, generally, they won't end up uh, having much good results. And while God actually really uh, progresses sciences and digitization and digitalization, therefore, I be, believe the government should be actually promoting rather than setting rules. Right. Thank you. It's a light touch approach. If possible, no touch. <laughs> okay. All right. Dr. Lee. Oh. 
I, I seriously believe a government private sector partnership is very, very positive. Uh, governments, you're talking of people in governments, uh, civil service mentality, they have to have strong code of what they can do and cannot do. But in the area of uh, challenging landscape, you need the private sector that has a deep knowledge and the experience to take it through. So this partnership is very important. Government to smooth the way or promote, like uh, Tan Sri says, and the private sector to be able to take the risk and move ahead. Mm. So you're suggesting uh, private se sector take the risk, government get the results. Uh, yes. <laughs> the, risk the government, uh, the government has to smooth the way in one way or another. Smoothen the way, right? So uh, yeah, that's why sometimes government uh, may need the input on how they can uh, smoothen the way, all right? Okay, right. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, still on this uh, same topic, I think uh, we, we could also hear quickly from Dr. Henry Go as well as uh, uh, this uh, Mr. Connect. Yeah, I think uh, what uh, Mr. Go was mentioning is true. Uh, it's best that government uh, don't do anything. <laughs> but I think, obviously, there needs to be some regulation. But however, regulation is, is very much to protect consumer rather than regulation to in the form of uh, how managing how companies or, uh, or the commerce should function. I think that is a two different part part to, to how it's supposed to be. So I really think is that uh, they should be regulated, but regulated for the sake of consumer protection. And it should be very much different uh, from what their thoughts are uh, in how they're regulating the uh, physical industries uh, than rather the digitization uh, or digitalized industry at this point in time. Well, very interesting. It's uh, more towards like protecting the consumers rather than regulating the, the industry players. All right. Uh, and how about Mr. Konesh? What's your thought about it? Yeah, so uh, since this is a transformation journey and I believe transformation is a function of uh, challenging and changing the status quo, right? So therefore, somebody innovates something or somebody disrupts something, right? So, and then uh, the disruption then eventually is adopted by masses and then becomes an innovation and turns into monetization opportunity. So from that level, I mean, government can easily, as uh, uh, my fellow panelists suggested that a PPP model works very fine, where uh, useful disruptions can be identified, uh, discussed and collaborated, uh, consulted amongst the industries and uh, learnings can be leveraged. So that part can certainly help us understand that disruption and how we are trying to solve a problem differently. And then defining the measures which can then take shape of uh, enabling regulations, right? Uh, that is something which we think and PPP model works really well. And that should be encouraged and accelerated for new technologies. All right, PPP, to define problem and then uh, from there, then uh, have the, the way to smoothen the regulation. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to also open the question uh, to you know members on, on the floor from the floor and I just have one more question for the panelists to uh, to respond to <clears throat> which is about ASEAN harmonizing the digital infrastructure as well as infrastructure that includes the data center data sovereignty standards right what is your view about ASEAN working towards harmonizing the digital infrastructure and infrastructure? Maybe we can reverse the sequence, start from Mr. Konesh. Yeah, absolutely, this is uh, very important, the harmonization around the uh, connectivity and the uh, info infrastructure is, uh, basically start with, uh, see these technologies like 4G, 5G, uh, they are not developed yesterday. Their years of research have gone into it, right? And these technologies starting from a uh, large amount of spectrum availability to cater to the needs of uh, industries and people uh, across industries. For example, 5G, uh, we, uh, we believe that almost 2,000 gigahertz of spectrum is required in each country. Therefore, clearance and availability of that spectrum, visibility of that spectrum is something that can be harmonized across the region. Now, there is a lot of... Uh, uh, millions of dollars have gone into uh, building these 4G infrastructure 
and that needs to be strengthened because there is a lot of disparity between performance of these 4G networks amongst ASEAN countries itself, and we can leverage all those strengths. Uh, moving on, there is a lot of uh, uh, priorities that can be built up in, particularly in data centers, in turning those technical solutions green and sustainable compliant because a lot of energy goes uh, is consumed and that can be made more efficient. So that is one area where harmonization can come in in terms of uh, strengthening that uh, and sustaining that final, uh, the info network, enabling network. Then things, small things like uh, uh, building these networks faster is uh, uh, basically simplifying the right of pay, pay policies and enabling competitiveness so that more and more investment is attracted in uh, building the uh, harmonization of this foundation. All right. Yep. Uh, yeah. So we, we're going to wrap up actually uh, because uh, <clears throat> you know that uh, organizer has just informed me that uh, our time is actually up. So I would like the, the rest of the panelists to quickly use one minute to respond to this uh, harmonizing infrastructure as well as infrastructure. Uh, yeah, probably I can just uh, quickly do it. Uh, I think, yes, it's true. I think uh, going forward, if there's a possibility to harmonize infrastructure, this is very good. And of course, uh, data. But I think it's still a long way to do. I mean, looking at the point is that at this point in time, uh, recognizing uh, each country's uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccination certification is really a big problem, right? So I think uh, still a long way to go. But I think if that's can, something that can happen, I think there will be... Uh, much easier for for the whole ASEAN country to progress. Uh, a lot of work to be done, but I think this uh, coordination that must, must be done for a long term benefit of the region. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. Please. Well, ASEAN, ASEAN partnership definitely is the way to go. We talked about the inking trade trade blocks and trade uh, partnerships. Inking governance in a shared digital economy is very important. Wow. Inking is a word. Thank you. <laughs> and Mr. Go. Um, yeah, there are two sides to harmonization. And one of it is efficiency. And the, the other side, Dr. Lee has just covered, that is shared values. Now, efficiency side, definitely digitization is going to move to the cloud. And, and we uh, have just announced a joint effort with IBM. And uh, later, there will be an, an, another announcement, joint effort with Microsoft, I think that is definitely the trend to move uh, forward. And we, and we have seen that in the last 15 years, it's moving forward. Right, moving forward, right. Thank, yeah. thank you, Mr. Goh. And uh, to conclude the session, I would like each and every uh, panelist here to give one sentence to share your own inner voice about the digital ASEAN your inner voice, what does your inner voice uh, tells you? We can oh, start with... Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll just quickly start and I've been talking about mathematics, the invisible hand, the trends. And I think it is driven by nature. So that, that is my inner voice. All right, the nature. Yeah. Dr. Lee? So if digitalization needs to provide an uplift to human lives. If it doesn't, that is a wasted effort at the end. To uplift human life. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Henry? Yeah, I think the point yeah. is uh, digitalization gives an equal playing ground for all of us uh, as if we want to spearhead ourselves as, as, as a region to, to be more competitive and to be even a developed region as a whole. Digital is the opportunity for us to achieve that. Thanks. Equal playing ground and opportunity. Right, Mr. Konesh. Yeah, I would say collaboration for digitalization is key because uh, as the African proverb says, to uh, run fast, you need to run alone. But to need to run far, you need to run together. So we need to well, collaborate. So with that, let's run together. And I would like to ask everyone together with me to thank our distinguished panelists for your insightful sharing this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.